Meanwhile, in this jungle war, the United States is becoming more fully involved with each passing day. In 1968, America was at war. In the jungles of Vietnam and at home. It would be one of the most tumultuous years in our nation's history. And in that same year, a young Texan named Jose Anzaldúa would make a decision that would change his life forever. Ten days before I graduated from high school in 1968, I uh, joined the Marine Corps into the uh, uh, what they call delayed enlistment program, which they take you in under reserve status, and once you complete your high school, then you're sent off uh, to boot camp. In my particular case, I went to uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot, San Diego, California. I chose the Marine Corps specifically because I wanted a challenge in my life, and uh, having been exposed to uh, the other services, I, I felt that the Marine Corps had more to offer for me uh, as far as uh, how I would develop on an individual basis. When I took the Armed Services Vocational and Aptitude Battery, which is a written test that you take before you enlist, I uh, sc scored in what they call a Category 1 uh, uh, test level which is in the high 100s. And when I had that high of a test score, I figured that I could ask for some type of training, uh, i.e. Uh, vocational, elect electrical, or uh, just being a uh, firefighter or something of that nature. When I brought that up to my recruiter, he looked me in the eye and said, the only thing I can offer you is uh, to join the Marine Corps and you're going straight to Vietnam. He says, I, I can offer you nothing else. For nearly 200 years, the word Marine has meant loyalty, courage, and dedication. The key to this success has been leadership and training. Since 1775, the Marine Corps has extended the privilege of service to men who are able to accept responsibility, setting a pace for others to follow. These recruits now are Marines, in body, in mind, and in spirit. And no matter where the challenge, the Marines are ready to defend their country, ready today, ready tomorrow, a part of the big team the United States Marine Corps. The first day my foot hit the soil of Vietnam, I was greeted by uh, uh, 105 rockets that the uh, North Vietnamese were firing. So we got off of one plane and ran onto helicopters and from there went to uh, a fire base called An Hoa. The way Marines operate, and some people will tell you that there was a lot of disgruntled people uh, in the Marines, we didn't have that problem. Uh, we saw no colors, there, there is no race, there was only one thing and we were all green and we functioned like a well-oiled machine. My experience is up to the point prior to me getting captured as I was in country in Vietnam, uh, just basically revolved around a lot of my friends getting killed. Uh, I was wounded uh, three times. After the second time, according to Marine Corps policy, I was supposed to have been sent back to Okinawa. Uh, my battalion commander told me that he uh, was making a decision to keep me in country with him because he needed help and as a, as a corporal, he says, I'm not sending you back to Okinawa. Uh, I got wounded the third time, which by the third time, you're supposed to go to the United States back home. And I wound up once again being told by my, my battalion commander that he needed me. And I didn't question him. I just, you know, as he provided me this information, uh, I took it and went on with it. Didn't think anything of it. Uh, 
spent a lot of time uh, in combat, engaged in uh, open firefights, uh, if not on a daily basis, a weekly basis. And at one particular point in time, as a uh, Lance Corporal, I uh, was the only S2 scout that was alive in the battalion. Everybody else had been killed. Uh, we had companies that had been uh, decimated with casualties of 60 to 65 percent total losses. And when I say total losses, I'm not talking about wounded, I'm talking about dead. At the point in time uh, where right before I got captured, I had uh, roughly 11 days left in country. Uh, at the 20th day, they were supposed to pull me to the back to the uh, combat base and let me start uh, winding down prior to coming back to the States, but that didn't happen. What led to my capture, uh, a Marine Lieutenant Company commander who was at a place called Liberty Bridge on his own called me in. I was a Marine Corporal and told me that he needed somebody to provide uh, radio support, mortar and artillery, and if need be, air support to a South Vietnamese unit. I had spent roughly about nine days with this South Vietnamese unit. Uh, I was to train them on how to patrol, uh, how to call in uh, different types of uh, artillery and mortar rounds if, as needed. And I roughly spent about 16 hours a day with them in the bush, just teaching them how to patrol and keep them safe. Uh, that same Marine Lieutenant called me uh, on January the 10th and told me that there was gonna be a sweeping unit, uh, which would be the entirety of 5th Marine Regiment sweeping up the Tubon River and what the Marine Lieutenant wanted me to do is to take my South Vietnamese platoon and insert ourselves in front of the Marine unit and pull out the civilians, get them to the roadside so they could be relocated and so they would not become casualties of the sweeping action. Uh, we went in uh, to do this uh, on the morning of the 11th, uh, at 0130, we went out in darkness and started pulling out the civilians. And after we had removed approximately 35 of these South Vietnamese villagers, as we went back into another area across a paddy dike, we hit a U-shaped ambush. Uh, not a large force, uh, but the South Vietnamese unit that I was at probably at best was marginal in, in their abilities. Uh, took a lot of fire, uh, a lot of casualties, lost my radio, my radio got shot. Uh, I had a Kit Carson scout assigned with me and uh, as the South Vietnamese troops ran off, he stayed with me. And we were in this uh, firefight that basically lasted for 16 hours. Everything that the Marine Corps ever taught me uh, it went into my, what we call brain housing group. And never in my wildest days did I ever thought that I was gonna have to recall things that were told to me. Uh, one of the first things that was told to me was that you never run out of ammo, you always save one round. And that one round is for you to kill yourself rather than be caught because of what they anticipated they would do to us. Uh, the other part of this was that, and I carried uh, white, green, and red smoke. The purpose of that is there was uh, two, maybe three uh, Marine Corps helicopter gunships that were over the top of me. Uh, they would come down real low and, and, and they knew I was too big that I, that I wasn't a Vietnamese. And when I got to the point uh, where I had one round left in my 45, 
I was laying behind this paddy dike and one of them ran up over the top of the paddy dike and I messed up and shot him with my last round. So the only thing I had was the red smoke. Uh, the red smoke is for you to pop and let it drop on the ground in front of you so the helicopter gunships kill you. And for whatever reason, they didn't. To this day, I don't know why. I did what I was trained to do. Had they, the helicopter pilots, done what they were trained to do, they would have killed me. But that's the way it was supposed to be. This story was supposed to have ended that way, and it didn't. What they did uh, is myself and my Kit Carson scout, they scooped us up, uh, pigeon winged us, and that's basically where they pull both your arms back and uh, with a rope tie your elbows together behind you, and then they have a lead line, and uh, there was seven of them. Uh, they led us to the river and as they were opening up a spider hole that they were going to put me in, they took out uh, an AK-47 and shot my Kit Carson scout in the head, uh, killed him. And then they uh, stuck me in this spider hole. I had one NVA soldier on my right hand side with a pistol pointed at me and another one on my left hand side with a pistol pointed at me and the hole was directly above me with a trap door closed on it. And we sat there and the entire 5th Marine Regiment walked over the top of us. After uh, the 5th Marine Regiment went over the top of our spider hole, they probably around 10, 30, 11 o'clock that night, they pushed me up out of the spider hole. They came out and uh, I spent the next three months walking to uh, the Laos-Vietnam border to a uh, informal jungle prisoner of war camp. That prisoner of war camp uh, had a population at its highest of 26 and only 12 people survived out of it. Uh, people succumbed to their wounds. Uh, a lot of people died either directly or indirectly as a result of starvation. Just terrible, terrible conditions. Uh, very little right, uh, food. We had rice. And uh, if you remember the old timey uh, little pet milk cans that are about that big, they gave us half of one of those a day and that was it. And then whatever we could catch, uh, we could eat. And that went from snakes to bats to some of the camp chickens that would uh, wander through the yard. And if we could get one without them catching us, uh, we do that. Uh, at one point, uh, some of uh, my fellow prisoners of war killed a cat and got killed or got caught cooking it. And they were beat severely for that. So he just basically uh, tried to survive in, 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 the, in the jungles. Uh, when I got caught, I roughly weighed about 172 pounds, and after two years in the jungles, my weight uh, was around 117. Uh, lost a lot of friends, uh, and it, it was just a climate of everybody trying to survive uh, those ridiculous uh, circumstances. We were in an area where there was a lot of B-52 traffic, a lot of uh, jet traffic, you know, attack jets, and a lot of helicopter traffic. And on this particular morning, for whatever reason, uh, the helicopters normally would pass over, over us or to the side and continue wherever they were going. But on this particular morning, they were actually circling over the top of us. And uh, the guards came in and told us to stay in, the, in the, this hut we lived in. And as we sat there, 
these three loaches, which are light observation helicopters, uh, started buzzing the, uh, the hut that we were at. And we were in triple canopy, which is, uh, normal canopy runs about 20 foot. So if you add another 40 foot on top of that, that constitutes triple canopy. And I could hear the rotors of the helicopters setting down on the trees and cutting the trees down as they were and they're they're just going up and down trying to cut their way into where we were and i'm sitting there thinking to myself now are are they gonna let this happen and we're just gonna stay in here and then we're all gonna have at it here and something good or something bad is gonna happen uh as they kept trying to cut those trees down uh the guards came in there, about five of them, and they said Didi Mao, which means run in a hurry. And of the 12 of us, uh, 11 went out the door and I brought up the back end. And as I went out the door into the uh, uh, camp yard, uh, I tripped and fell flat on my face. And I could hear that light, light observation helicopter just continually cut. And one would pull off and another one would come in. And I rolled over and I looked up and they, uh, I could see the pilot and I could see two door gunners, uh, one on either side and, and uh, light observation helicopters kind of look like a bubble. They're not real big. But the door gunner that I looked at on the right side of the craft as it was nose down looking at me, uh, started smiling, gave me a thumbs up and waved at me. And they caught me and drug me off. I was a lost chance. <laughs> After the heartbreaking failed rescue attempt by U.S. forces, Anzal Dua and his fellow prisoners were dragged away by North Vietnamese guards and would then face a grueling forced march north. What happened after that rescue, and it was a formal rescue attempt, and we found out, we were debriefed on that after we got back. Uh, but after that rescue attempt, the uh, Vietnamese uh, came to the conclusion that they could not provide sufficient security over us, and they were all told to take us to the north. So uh, we walked for three months to get up there. The next camp after that was a place called Plantation Garden, which uh, used to be an old uh, French supply warehouse. And the, Viet the North Vietnamese had basically broken down the warehouses into uh, actual jail cells with no windows, uh, double doors that, French doors, I guess you could call them, that had uh, locks and uh, timbers across the doors. Uh, we slept on the floor and had a bucket uh, to relieve ourselves in uh, and just basically stayed locked up pretty much about 23 hours and 45 minutes a day. After the 10 months at the plantation garden, uh, the North Vietnamese once again took us from plantation garden and they uh, brought all the prisoners of war together at the Hanoi Hilton, which was a formal prison system, uh, multi-level, uh, total and absolute uh, lockdown, iron bars, thick concrete walls. After spending more than three years in captivity fighting for survival, Anzal Dua and his fellow prisoners would finally be released in early 1973 during the now famous Operation Homecoming. I was released on March the 8th on the last release group. Our group was delayed three or four different times because of arguing between the uh, North Vietnamese government and our government. Uh, I was flown to the Naval Hospital at Camp Pendleton and I spent the uh, first four months 
back in the United States in the hospital uh, where they were trying to get me sufficiently well enough to go home. Uh, I had a lot of uh, intestinal parasites that they were having difficulty getting rid of, uh, some leftover uh, residual effects of dysentery and malaria and scurvy and things of, of that nature. Uh, and I was finally able to go home. The Marine Corps uh, sent me home for 90 days on convalescent leave and they said, go home, figure out what you wanted to do. The only thing that was comfortable for me was for me to remain in the Marine Corps because it's, I knew what was expected of me and I was comfortable in that environment. And it was very, very familiar with me or to me. So I re-enlisted for six years. Ansel Dua's re-enlistment would eventually lead him to becoming an officer, serving for more than 20 years. He would retire in 1992 as a major. I was still very comfortable with the Marine Corps. And I had a uh, chief of staff, a gentleman by the name of uh, Colonel Rust. I asked him one day, I says, uh, Colonel, I said, uh, how do you know when it's time to retire? He says, you'll get up one day. And he says, it, a light will go off and you will realize it's time to go. Which didn't make any sense to me at the time, uh, but I always kept it in the back of my head. And lo and behold, it did happen. My situation uh, regarding the prisoner of war issue and what it has done to me and what it has not done to me basically uh, has allowed me to uh, be able to come to some conclusions relative to why it is that I am the way I am and how it is that uh, I decided to devote myself to the Marine Corps to continue to serve my country and then to uh, nurture my family and try to do the best I could for them relative to educations and, and opportunities. I, I can't explain to this day why it is that I'm still here. I have always known that this was not supposed to be it's, it just wasn't supposed to be. I'm not supposed to be sitting here talking to you. Uh, I was supposed to have been killed and buried in my hometown in Texas. And when I came back, I came to the realization that an individual cannot survive those circumstances solely on the strengths that you own within you, that there is something of a greater nature that nurtures us and guides us for some reason, which I don't know what the reason is, but I, you, you cannot endure that without a, a greater power. If you see me out here on the street, you wouldn't know me from anybody else. And I pride myself in that, because when I retire, I knew that I had given all that I could give up to that point, but I knew that that was not the end of my life and what was left and what I was given. And I was given a lot to be able to come back home, uh, that, that I would not make waste of that and, and truly try to contribute the best I could. Whether it's to everybody's satisfaction or not, that's not a concern of mine. In early 2019, Major Ansel Dua's family contacted Sig Sauer and discussed the idea of doing a tribute to their father. It's something that kind of like really drove me uh, towards wanting to, to do this project or to uh, come up with the commemorative pistol. I had seen a, um, a quote online. It said something along the lines of, for the valorous no no grave, uh, a man will never truly die so long as his name is spoken. And I feel like this 
project, the whole uh, thing that SIG has done for our family uh, is very historic and it's something that will uh, kind of solidify his, uh, his story. And I feel like as, as long as that pistol's around, somebody will always uh, see his name and it will inspire others to look up uh, what could have uh, inspired the project. I, I went into the Marine Corps um, when I was 21. Um, had to had join Marine Corps because my, my father was a Marine. So I, I, any other branch was, wasn't going to be suitable. My experience in the Marine Corps, uh, I joined when I was 21, uh, did uh, two combat deployments, uh, was deployed three out of the four years I was in. My first combat deployment was in the Horn of Africa, uh, doing uh, counterterrorism operations with the Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa in uh, Camp Lemonet in Djibouti. Uh, my unit was uh, stop, lost, stop, moved, and uh, spent the rest of my time with was in uh, Iraq in the Al Anbar province. Half of my time I was in uh, Camp Blue Diamond in Ramadi, and the other half of the time I was in Fallujah, and south of Fallujah in uh, Al Abaniya. Because he was in the Marine Corps, and we grew up in that, that environment, um, it was kind of like we were uh, an extension of his military family at the house. Everything was, it was, I, I can honestly say, going into boot camp, uh, it wasn't a surprise for me. As soon as I got there, I was like, oh, you, you guys didn't expect this? And I was like, so it was, kind of a, an eye-opener for them, but I, I was, uh, I knew what I was heading into. It was, it was challenging being the, uh, the younger brother, uh, but it gave me uh, a lot to look up to. Um, you know, my brothers, my father, a uh, lot, uh, lot, of, lot of tough love. I knew bits and pieces of his story. Uh, we never really, he never came out and told us a lot. Uh, obviously, you know, he, that's not something you would you know, tell you, your, your children, uh, especially um, at a younger age. Uh, I started getting more and more as people were, I guess, learning of his, uh, his story. The sacrifices that he made, that uh, just kind of puts everything into perspective, uh, that he's a hero. Um, I, I tell, tell him that my father was strict, but that I'm thankful for everything. Uh, thankful for uh, how, how he raised us, thankful for you know, what he gave. That he's, he's, he's a great man. Um, these are things that I, I probably knew when I was younger, but didn't really, uh, wasn't able to really to, to value uh, up until now. After learning more about Major Anzaldua's family and his amazing story, the team at SIG Custom Works set out to create a fitting tribute to an American hero. The 1911 is an iconic American pistol that lends itself to a great deal of customization. The Major's pistol has several key pieces of his history. On top of the slide is a set of dog tags. The first one has the Major's full information. Uh, the Major's service number was replaced with the longitude and latitude that he was lost at. The second dog tag has the phrase, you are not forgotten and that is from the POW MIA flag. We thought it was important to honor all uh, Vietnam veterans and POWs. On the left side of the slide is the Vietnam service ribbon. On the right side of the slide is the POW ribbon. On the pistol's grips, we incorporated the POW MIA flag on both sides. As a Marine, it was very special for me to be able to work on a project to honor the Major, a man that has given so much to this country. SIG is a company that was founded, and its DNA is about servicing the military. And that means also respecting and honoring the veterans in this country, and they are part, a big part of the company. One of the unique parts of SIG is that almost a third of our employees are veterans, and we're so honored to have them. We view it as an honor to hire them and an honor to have them lead this company. Meeting Major Anzaldua at SIG was one of the highlights for close to 2,000 of our employees. It was just an amazing event to hear a person that has endured so much suffering, survived it, and he's humbled by meeting us instead of us 
being humbled by him, it was just an amazing event for all of us. We are honored to be able to present this tribute to his service. And I speak on behalf of all 2,000 SIG employees in saying thank you.